So the next important condition which we need to know is EDH or extradural hematoma. This is EDH. And EDH or extradural hematoma occurs due to a high velocity impact. So the mechanism, what is the mechanism of extradural hemorrhage? Mechanism is usually a high velocity impact. And the age group in which it is seen, it is high velocity impact. And the age group in which it is seen is usually young patients. Now, if you talk about the anatomy, the anatomy is that it is usually arterial in nature. It is usually arterial in nature. And the vessel implicated is the middle meningeal artery. The vessel implicated is the middle meningeal artery. This question has been asked many, many times in the exam that middle meningeal artery is the vessel implicated in extradural hemorrhages. Now, if we talk about the clinical features, what are the clinical features with which the patient is going to present? The classical clinical feature is a lucid interval. Now, you've already discussed lucid interval and forensic. Lucid interval is defined as the period of normal consciousness between two episodes of unconsciousness. So, period of normal consciousness between two episodes of unconsciousness. So, let me just uh, narrate an incident to you. This actually happened when I was a postgraduate, I was posted in the emergency. There was a naval officer. It was monsoon season. And this guy was uh, driving his bike without wearing a helmet. And his bike skid and he hit the ground. He lost consciousness for a couple of minutes. He was with another guy who was with him. They both recovered after a couple of minutes, got on their bike, went home. When he reached home, he was feeling hungry, started cooking for himself. And while cooking, he collapsed again. Right. And by the time his roommate brought him to the emergency, he was already dead. Right. So this period of normal consciousness between the two episodes of unconsciousness, when he was cooking food for himself, when he drove back, that is known as the lucid interval. Right. So this is the classical tale of EDH. This is how patients present to you. So before I go any further, I would just a sincere request to all of you. I've seen a lot of medical students. They use mopeds, they use bikes, they use scooties. And because they just have to travel from their hostel to the hospital, they don't wear helmets. Please don't make that mistake. I've seen a lot of mishaps happening. So even if it's a short distance, please wear your helmet when you're riding the bike. So lucid interval can be seen in EDH. Now lucid interval is common in EDH but not pathognomic of ETH. That means it can be seen in other brain injuries as well. It can be seen in other brain injuries. So please do remember that. Okay. The investigation of choice for extradural hemorrhage is NCCT. And when we do the NCCT, what do we get here? This is the NCCT. You will see a biconvex hemorrhage here. You will see a biconvex or a lens shaped hemorrhage. Biconvex or lens shaped hemorrhage. And this hemorrhage is between the skull and the dura. This is between the skull and the dura. And I will show you a video in some time of evacuation of an extradural hemorrhage, where I'll tell you that once the skull cap is removed, once you remove that craniotomy uh, flap, you will see the bleeding vessel there just above the dura. Okay. So this is extradural hemorrhage and the management of these patients. The management of these patients is to carry out a craniotomy, carry out a craniotomy or to make a burr hole. What is the difference between the two? This will be clear in the video. Burr hole is when you just drill a hole and craniotomy is when you remove a flap of the bone and you actually visualize the bleeding vessel. So craniotomy is the one which is preferred. So we either do a craniotomy or a burr hole. Craniotomy is the one which is preferred. If you have to make the burr hole or if you have to do the craniotomy, it's usually done close to the terion. And what is the terion? Terion, you've read in anatomy, it is an H-shaped area. It is an H-shaped area where various cranial sutures meet. You can see here the various cranial sutures meeting here. And this is the most common site where EDH occurs. And this is where you'll make the burr hole or you'll raise the craniotomy flap. Now, what are the indications to carry out craniotomy in EDH? So the indications to carry out craniotomy, 
the indications for craniotomy. This has been updated from the latest Bailey and the ATLS manual. And you should know these updates because this is a very important topic. So if the clot size is more than 30 cc, if the midline shift is more than 5 millimeters, or if it's more than 1.5 centimeter in thickness, these are the indications to carry out an evacuation or to make a burr hole. Now, I'll show you a video where I'll show you both the burr hole and a craniotomy flap being made. So this was a patient who had come with bleeding and there was an extradural hemorrhage. And you can see that this drill, this uh, drill is being used to create a burr hole. So you can see that the drill is creating a burr and now the hole is almost complete. Now this drill is being removed. You can see the burr hole there. That burr hole is being pointed out and that is the burr hole which can be used to control extradural hemorrhage. But in the same case, uh, this was just for demonstration uh, by my friend uh, who is also the neurosurgery faculty in uh, Marrow, Dr. Nishant. Now, now, in the same patient, he was creating a craniotomy flap as well. So you can see that this craniotomy flap is being created. He's cutting the bone and this is going to be lifted out as a flap, right? So now the flap is complete. He's just going to dissect out the flap. And when he lifts that flap off the dura, you will see a pulsating bleeder there. You will see a pulsating bleeder. Right, so this is the flap which is being lifted and you can see right here, you can see the pulsating bleeder which is there, which you can then coagulate. Now, another thing which I want to highlight in EDH and this is extremely important is that we have to know which side to make the burr hole or the craniotomy. So, how do we localize the site of injury? How do we localize site? We localize the site using an NCCT. So, if we have NCCT, we will get to know which side is the injury and we are going to make the burr hole or do the craniotomy flap on that side. But... If NCCT is not available, if NCCT is not available and you are faced with an emergency where supposing you're in a primary health center or the CT machine is down, you don't have an NCCT available, then how do you know which side to make the burr hole on? So please remember, if NCCT is not available, then burr hole or craniotomy, then burr hole or craniotomy is done on the side of the dilated pupil is done on the side on on side of dilated pupil right so that is a rough indicator and this question was asked almost five six years back in the exam that if ncct is not there how do we know we'll make the burr hole on the side of the dilated pupil now there's another phenomena which i want you to know about and that phenomena is known as a false localizing sign is known as a false localizing sign or Kernohan's notch phenomena or Kernohan's notch phenomena, right? So let me just give you an example to explain to you what Kernohan's notch phenomena or this false localizing sign is all about. So I just told you, supposing the patient has a left-sided EDH, supposing the patient has a left-sided EDH, now, because of this, the left dilated pupil is going to be there, right? There will be left dilated pupil, which this patient is going to have. And because of this left sided, because of left sided EDH, what can happen that there can be temporal herniation, right? There can be temporal or uncle herniation on the left side. There can be temporal or uncle herniation on the left side. And when this temporal or uncle herniation occurs, it will press the Kernohan's notch. The Kernohan's notch. That means it presses on the presses on corticospinal tract. It presses on the corticospinal tract of the right side. Right. So it presses on the corticospinal tract of the other side when the temporal lobe herniates down. And I've covered these brain herniations in the neurosurgery one and neurosurgery two modules. So for details, you can refer to those modules. Now, when this temporal herniation occurs, it is going to press on the corticospinal tract of the other side. So it's pressing on the corticospinal tract of the right side. When it presses on the corticospinal tract of the right side, what is going to happen? There's going to be left hemiparesis. 
there is going to be left hemiparesis. So that's a false localizing sign. So why is it a false localizing sign? Because if you notice this patient and if you see that there's left hemiparesis, you know that the corticospinal tract decussates, right? So you would think that the bleeding is on the right side. And you can falsely say that it's on the right side. But in reality, it is the same side bleed. So this is a special phenomena which you should know about. It has been asked in the exam once. So this was regarding extradural hemorrhage. Moving on to the next condition that is subdural hemorrhage or SDH. Now SDH can be of three types. You can either have acute SDH, subacute SDH or chronic SDH. Acute SDH is one which manifests within three days. Subacute manifests within three to 21 days and chronic manifests after 21 days. And the one important for our exam is the chronic SDH. So chronic SDH is typically seen in elderly patients. So as opposed to EDH, which was young patients, this is elderly patients and it is following a trivial trauma. So no high velocity trauma, trivial trauma. And here it is venous bleeding. Here it is venous bleeding and it is the cortical bridging veins which are implicated the cortical bridging veins which are implicated in chronic subdural hemorrhage so this you should know about this is the cortical bridging veins which are there what are the clinical features the clinical features of chronic subdural hemorrhage is that the patient is going to suffer from a trivial trauma there's going to be trivial trauma the patient is going to be normal for few weeks few days to weeks no symptoms no loss of consciousness. But after few days to weeks, there is altered mental sensorium. There is altered mental sensorium. After a few days to weeks, there is altered mental sensorium. That is how the patient is going to present. And when you do a CT, when you do a CT scan in these patients, you are going to get a concavo convex hemorrhage, right? So we are going to see a concavo convex hemorrhage here and concavo convex hemorrhage or lens or crescenteric hemorrhage is seen in subdural hemorrhage, concavo convex or crescenteric hemorrhage. And the bleeding is between the dura Bleeding is between the dura and arachnoid. Bleeding is between the dura and the arachnoid in patients with subdural hemorrhage. Again, the management of these patients is to carry out a craniotomy. And what are the indications to carry out a craniotomy? So management is to do a craniotomy and to evacuate the hemorrhage. The indications to carry out a craniotomy if the thickness of the clot is more than one centimeter, there's more than five millimeter midline shift or if more than two points GCS fall is there, intracranial pressure is more than 20 or if there is a fixed dilated pupil. If any two out of these two, right, more than two points GCS fall, intracranial pressure more than 20 or fixed dilated pupil, any two... Two points out of these or the one of these indications, you have to carry out a craniotomy to drain the subdural hemorrhage. One final point in subdural hemorrhage, which I want you to know about is that with respect to brain injury, with respect to brain injury, extent of brain injury, extent of brain injury is more in SDH as compared to EDH. So this is an important thing which is written in both Bailey and the ATLS manual that the extent of brain injury is more in subdural hemorrhage as compared to extradural hemorrhage. Now before we move on to secondary brain injury, I want you to just note a few points regarding subarachnoid hemorrhage. So we are talking about traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the most common cause is trauma. Most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is trauma. But majority of subarachnoid, majority of traumatic SAH, majority of traumatic SAH can be managed conservatively. Can be managed conservatively, right? So majority of traumatic SAH can be managed conservatively. It is very different from the subarachnoid hemorrhage which occurs spontaneously, which I've covered in the neurosurgery modules, where you have to go and clip the vessel, right? Where you, if you have a berry aneurysm and it ruptures, that can also give rise to subarachnoid hemorrhage. Those you have to clip. But traumatic SAHs are usually small and the majority can be managed conservatively. <music>